Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to class. Today we are going to talk about linguistic relativity. It is also popularly known as Sapir Whorf hypothesis. This is a very uh, long debated issue, and this hypothesis has been tested, evaluated, examined, and criticized for many reasons. But before we move to this, we all understand language to be a social reality. Language is a social entity, social reality. And for centuries, the linguists and people working on language have reiterated this idea and disposition. Right from dialectology, to the modern social linguistics post 1960s. In all these studies, what we see, we see language is located and situated in the social cultural context. But what kind of relationship language shares with society and culture? There have been different positions on that. And today, in this class, we will talk about one of the perspectives put forward in the works of Edward Sapir and Benjamin Lee Horf, and the deductions made out of their work, which is referred to in the literature as Sapir Whorf hypothesis. It is also called linguistic relativity or Whorfian disposition. So, we will we'll talk about this very important and significant topic today and also examine its relevance in the modern linguistics framework. Now, we all understand that language is socio-culturally rooted and uh, multiple studies and uh, you know theoretical positions have strengthened this idea. We cannot undermine the instrumentality of language in encoding our inherited culture, our narratives, history, stories, and experiences. And uh, every member of the community derives a collective identity out of it. A collective identity out of it. So, the importance of language in society, importance of language in culture cannot be overstated. However, what kind of relationship language shares with the social structures and cultural forms? This is a debatable issue. But there is no doubt that they have some kind of relationship and they are interdependent. If you look at works by, let's say, M.K. Halliday, he also talks about language in terms of not just signs. But he talks about language as source of meaning, so making sense of structures. If you look at the idea of communicative competence put forward by Dalhams, he also reiterates the same position by invoking socio cultural appropriacy of use. So, the form and the function they are converging into one composite unit. So, this is what uh, you know Dalhams proposes. In Halliday's proposal also, he says that social structures and configurations are reflected in language structures. But to what extent? Uh, if you go by the discussion as in Wado and Fuller, the seventh edition of an introduction to social linguistics. They posit four possible 
ways of discovering relationship between language and society, language and culture. One is the social structure may either influence or determine linguistic structure and or behavior. So, for example, if you look at, uh, you know, if you look at demographic uh, background and, you know, of, of the speakers, language in quotes, a lot of language structures reflect the demographic details to a certain extent where uh, they reflect the age, the gender, the background. So, we can say that, you know, it is somehow related. A second possibility is directly opposed to the first where linguistic structures or behavior may either influence or determine social structure or worldview. This is close to Sapir Worf idea. We'll come to that in a while. A third possible relationship that they mention is the influence of influence is bidirectional. So language structures encode. And, and reflect social structures and vice versa. And we can, we can substantiate this idea with the fact that rise in awareness of the status of women in society, women in empowerment, different feminist movements, languages have also gone certain changes. So now, uh, sexism in language or gender centric expressions in language are done away with and we are trying to make it neutral gender neutral so in that sense we know we can consider the changes in society or changes in social structure is also getting reflected by changes in linguistic structures or the fourth possibility is that there is no connection at all and uh, to the next extent that language cannot be a causative factor for changes in society or vice versa. So these are the four possible positions. But the position taken by other people also, like Gumpers for that matter, he also observes that social linguistics is an attempt to find correlations. Now, he is not talking about causat ca uh, no, causativity. So, language does not cause, or social structure does not cause changes in each other, but he is talking about correlations. So, can we have correlations between linguistic structures and social structures? So, he observes that social linguistic is an uh, attempt to find correlations between social structure and linguistic structure and to observe any changes that occur. So, uh, broadly what we see, people have been talking about a correlation, a relationship, a connection or how language is situated or located in a socio-cultural context. So, we can say that languages are socio-culturally rooted. But, uh, you know, in modern linguistics, we talk about correlations and relationship. Now, why this linguistic relativity is such a debated issue? If we do that, if we know that, if we do establish that language and society, language and cultures are related, then why do we have such a long debate and counter arguments in favor and also in against of this idea called linguistic relativity or what? It is referred to as linguistic determinism. The hypothesis of linguistic relativity, also known as Sapir Worf hypothesis, the Worf hypothesis is a principle suggesting that the structure of a language affects its speaker's worldview or cognition, and thus people's perceptions are relative to their spoken language. So, in a nutshell, what they want to say is that our world views are cons constrained, our world views are constrained by the language we speak. In other words, the categories, concepts and structures in a language 
restrict our understanding of the world. So for that matter, if X language X does not have a particular concept and a term available for it, according to this view, the person will not be able to understand and explain that concept. So that there is a constraint on cognitive ability of the individual. Uh, you know, they were studying like you know Benjamin Livor for studying Hopi language, American language, and uh, you know other people like Sapir, Bawas. There are other people also who express the similar, if not the exactly the same, similar ideas. So linguistic determinism is the idea that language and its structures limit the and determine human knowledge or thought. So this is this is the phrase which is the bone of contention. The phrase like limit and determine. That means language is seen here as a causing factor. And language causes such kind of limitations and determinism. That is the debatable issue. So Linguistic determinism is the idea that language and its structures limit and determine human knowledge or thought as well as thought processes such as categorization, memory and perception. So somehow if you look, if you go by the works as presented by Benjamin Lee Worf, it, it certainly puts lesser uh, known languages or the languages of minority or languages which are not mainstream languages or languages which are uh, you know perceived as underdeveloped not developed languages into a hierarchical situation and uh, Benjamin Lee Worf himself contrasted Hopi language and other such lesser known languages in America to you know standard European languages and he tried to establish that the people or the speakers of these lesser known languages have a limited worldview in terms of you know colors and you know, time and then you know, you know other aspects of language. So uh, the term implies that people who speak different languages as their mother tongues have different thought processes and this is what is challenged in modern linguistics. So this idea that our worldview is constrained by the language we speak, it's a very strong, uh, you know, disposition or position taken by Benjamin Lee Worf. And that is the bone of contention where he talks about delimit you know, limitations and constraints posed by the categories and structure of language on the thought process of its speaker. Uh, moving on, if we if you look at the history of this idea or this term like Sapir Worf hypothesis, it's interesting. It is interesting uh, because you know Benjamin Louis Worf was student of Edward Sapir, but somehow both could not author any article and proposal, work together, but did not author such thing in the lifetime. So this name. Sapir Worf hypothesis is taken as misnomer and a later development of the people who were in the field working in these areas and it is attributed to their, their deductions. So this name and the terminology is attributed to later deductions by other scholars. However, Sapir and Worf did not produce any kind of such proposal together. Uh, they never co-authored any work and never stated their ideas in terms of a hypothesis. Uh, a very frequent distinction is made between strong and weak forms of this hypothesis, right? And uh, Sapir Worf never set up such a dichotomy. So what we see, is that based on the individual deductions 
uh, deductions of their individual works and their affinity to such ideas, this phrase was coined and this hypothesis was deducted out of their individual works, all right, posthumously after, after their work. Now, if you look at the, the development of such an idea or a proposal, why the, this, this deduction, we find a continuity for over, you know, spread over more than a century. For example, in 1820, Humboldt right, uh, declared that diversity of language is not a diversity of signs and sounds, but a diversity of views of the world. So, we find this reference even more than 100 years back, where Humboldt also underlines the fact that the grammatical categories and the, you know, the concepts present in a language determine overall understanding of the environment and the world. So, when you compare two languages with gap in available concepts about certain things and words and terms, these gaps, these differences are not simply differences of terms. These differences are differences of their understanding, their worldview, and how they relate to the world. So, the entire perception and cognitive abilities. So, these gaps determine their entire cognitive abilities. This was by Humboldt, uh, 1820. Sapir also writes and he says, uh, before Sapir, let us talk about French Boas who was Sapir, Edward Sapir's teacher and he also remarks, however, he does not support such a strong view and uh, he has a very balanced view. He wrote, you know, it does not seem likely and there is any direct relation between the culture of a tribe and the language they speak. He was working on Inuits, except in so far as the form of language will be mold, you know, molded by the state of the culture, but not in so far as a certain state of culture is conditioned by the morphological traits of the language. So, he talks about differences, but he does not attribute these differences to differences of their thought process and any kind of conditioning restricted to language. But when we look at Sapir, his student, what he says, he says, no two languages are sufficiently similar to be considered as representing the same social reality. So, he exclusively makes a point that language represents social reality and because there is a difference between languages, the social realities are also different. So, the world in which different societies live are distinct worlds, not merely the same world with different labels attached. So, again he is making a very profound statement by saying that the differences in language of the world encodes the differences of their worldviews or differences in their or any kind of conditioning constrained by the languages they speak. But when we see, uh, you know, Worf, he took a very strong position like Humboldt, you know. So, he, he took up from where Sapir left but he, uh, you know, went further very strongly to claim that we cut nature up, organize it into concepts and ascribe significances as we do, largely because we are parties to an agreement to organize it in this way, an agreement that holds throughout our speech community and is codified in the patterns of our language. So, what he is saying? That the patterns of language codify the patterns of cultural practice. 
and the differences, the way we look at the world, the way we relate to the world, the way we relate to our environment, are the differences of, you know, cognition and understanding of the world. He refers to, you know, different color terms in Hopi or, you know, idea of time. Right. And by showing a contrastive uh, result by comparing standard European languages like English, German, French to the languages he was working with and, you know, tries to explain that these differences are not merely differences of categories and terms. These differences are the differences of the way speakers perceive time for that matter, perceive color for that matter. Now, we can look at the registers for that matter, you know, domain specific, let's say, registers. So, a doctor talks in a different register, an engineer talks in a different register. Does that mean that the non availability of certain terms of engineering into medical register allows you not to understand those concepts? But this is what exactly Worf is proposing. Sapir remarked. Human beings are very much at the mercy of the particular language which has become the medium of expression for their society. The fact of matter is that the real world is to be large extent unconsciously built up on the language habits of the group. So we can summarize as our worldviews or the speaker's worldview is constrained by the language speaker speaks. Uh, you know, this is a very strong position taken by even Humboldt or Sapir or, you know, Benjamin Lee Worf. Sapir acknowledged the close relationship between language and culture, maintained that they were inextricably related so that you could not understand or appreciate the one without the knowledge of the other. But Worf took it little further and made a very strong, took a very strong position. And he says that the relationship between language and culture was a deterministic one. So it determines. So it's not simply a, a non-causal relationship. But he talks about the causality of it. He talks about the language being cause for such a difference in cognitive abilities and perception of the world. So the social categories we create and how we perceive events and actions are constrained by the language we speak. Different speakers will therefore experience the world differently in so far as the languages they speak differ structurally. So the difference in language he took to be the difference in culture, difference in society. And these differences are not merely social or cultural differences, but cognitive differences. The whole idea that they cannot understand those concepts for which terms and words and categories are not available in the language. Right. So, for example, you know, I uh, I have exposure to a language of the northeast of India called Mizo. So, in Mizo, which is spoken largely in Mizoram, you have future and non-future distinction of time. Right. So, non-future is either past or present. But does that mean that the speakers of Mizo do not understand? what is past and what is present. That's not the case. Uh, for example, if you look at the, you know, Eskimos, they have a wide range of expressions to, to denote, you know, snow, freshly dropped snow, or I mean varieties of snow. But in English, we have only one or two terms. So, non-availability of the term for a concept, does that limit the understanding of the speaker? This is what, uh, you know, Benjamin Lee Worf claims. 
But does that mean so? Can't we understand those concepts uh, for which we do not have uh, an expression in our language? For example, can't I distinguish a range of colors even if my mother tongue does not have a particular name for that, uh, that particular color? So, how can or is it possible that that non-availability of the category in my language will limit my understanding of the range of colors, my understanding of the range of time fragments, right? Uh, philosophy in, in cultural anthropology, in psychology, lots of researches have been done to understand the relationship between language and thought. But if you look at the claims by Worf, he claims that different speakers will therefore experience the world differently insofar as the languages they speak differ structurally. So he takes structural difference to be the difference in cognitive abilities of his speakers. That is debated and questioned. How come? the differences or the non-availability of certain categories, grammatical categories, terms and expressions in a particular language limits the understanding of the speaker. And this, this proposal was severely criticized and became irrelevant, uh, you know, post Chomskyan arrival in the, in the field. And we see that 1957 was a turning point when B.F. Skinner came up with you know, behaviorist paradigm and Chomsky criticized it and then he came up with his syntactic theory, right, 1965. So this, this proposal or this hypothesis was dumped, severely criticized and you know critics like Lindbergh, Chomsky, Steven Pinker, they turned it down, any such proposal. And they criticize Worf for insufficient clarity because you know, if you look at the work by, by Worf, Worf died very early, almost like in age of 44. Benjamin Lee Worf was a chemical engineer and you know, he had lots of anecdotes and his experiences with, with uh, languages, expressions and categories. He has noted in his work, a very famous, you know, uh, such anecdote that he talks about, such instance that he talks about where he visits a fire station. He was a chemical engineer you know, and fire inspector, safety fire, fire safety inspector. And he visits a place, you know, uh, a center where uh, in a big hall, the hundreds of barrels were you know, kept full of petroleum that was uh, stored, would go down. And the other hall was a dumping yard where dumping place where empty barrels were kept, stored. Now the word empty, he, he mentions, you know, the word empty created a, a different perception among the workers who never smoke in the hall which stored barrels full of petroleum, but they didn't mind smoking in the areas, in the halls, where these empty barrels were put, stored. Despite knowing the fact that empty barrels are equally inflammable and dangerous, but this word empty, right, did the trick and they considered it to be less harmful. And such anecdotes and expressions and, you know, stories are intermittently present in, in and this, you know, Worf work, and this is the reason, perhaps, why he and he didn't have any any you know formal higher degree in linguistics or science of languages, and uh, we don't find a systematic scientific person you know, uh, exploration of this such ideas. So Steven Pinker, Lindbergh, or Chomsky, they criticize this inconsistency and clarity, insufficient clarity in his description of how language influences thought and not providing his conjectures and conclusions. Most of his arguments were in the form of anecdotes and speculations that served 
as attempts to show how exotic grammatical traits were connected to what were apparently equally exotic worlds of the thought. So we don't find any empirical, uh, you know, uh, you know, a serious empirical uh, persuasion or uh, you know, you know, exploration, research, and a conclusive conjecture as produced by Benjamin Lee Wolf. And that is why this this hypothesis was criticized and turned down. Now, the proponents of this idea or the new set of linguists who are working post 1980s, they have taken up this, this idea again and you know they claim it to be to have a dichotomy, so a softer version and the stronger version. So, in the softer version, they say that linguistic categories and usages only influence uh, you know, our thought and understanding of the world, but they cannot be treated as a causing factor for or as a, as a limiting factor for our cognitive skills and understanding of the world. So, the whole idea that the world view is concerned by the uh, constraint, I am sorry, the world view is constrained by the language we speak is turned down, but there is no denial that language and culture, language and society are inextricably linked and language encodes our cultural history, narratives, experiences and history, you know, understanding and there is a interdependent relationship between the two. But language cannot and does not constrain our, you know, cognitive abilities and perception about the world. So, this is what sapir wolf hypothesis is all about. Uh, the takeaways that Sapir and Worf never produced such a hypothesis together, they never co authored such thing, but certain deductions are made by later, later on by scholars, and you know, they came up with a strong version of this proposal, specifically mentioning and referring to uh, Benjamin Lee Worf's work, Sapir Worf hypothesis, it is also known as linguistic relativity or linguistic determinism theory, where uh, it is claimed that our thought processes, cognitive abilities and perception of the world is determined by the categories and structures of the language we speak or mother tongue. Uh, we also, we also discuss that, you know, relationship between language, language and culture is uh, well proved and, uh, you know, language is socio-culturally rooted and this is reflected in multiple works, uh, be it Dalheim's communicative competence, be it M.K. Halliday systemic functional grammar or uh, be it, you know, other works. They establish like, you know, uh, William Lebov's work for that matter, right? Uh, Ferguson's work for that matter, Charles Ferguson's work, right? Fishman's work, Joshua Fishman's work. So, all these works establish the fact that language and society are interrelated. There is a relationship. Language is a social uh, reality. But uh, the fact that language can be a causing factor of, of you know, limiting our understanding and thought processes is questioned and turned down. Uh, and now we conclude that uh, linguistic categories do have influence on the way we look at the world, the way we think, and uh, they cannot be a cause for the way we look at the world. But they do have some influence and language and culture are related, language and society are related. Even Halliday says that social structures are reflected in lingu linguistic structures, right? So that relationship is established, there is no denial of it. But the causality factor, the ca language become causing factor for limiting the understanding of the world or our perception is turned down in modern linguistics 
and now uh, you know the later on post 80s now scholars propagate this idea of influence not the determinism so the word determinism is not accepted in modern linguistics and we talk about the influence and relationship of language and society so this is it for now we will meet in other class with an another interesting topic about social linguistics in social linguistics thank you very much Thank you.